Hello, Photo Op listeners. I'm Ben Lucas. And I'm Stuart Marlantis. And you might notice that we have a brand new setup here on the Photo Op Podcast. So this is Photo Op, the podcast for all things photo and video. Uh, So I'm very excited to have a brand new studio, new mics, new season uh, here on the podcast. Welcome to season two, episode one. (laughs) <laughs> Woohoo! I can't believe we made it. Yes, uh, season one was about two years long, but uh, it's it's uh, been been a fun one. So, what mm-hmm. do we have in store for us today? Well, uh, we're going to be asking each other questions. I think we're going to be doing some interviews. Uh, this uh, first, um, these first two episodes are going to be a two parter. So, uh, the first one, uh, you're going to be interviewing me, and then I'm going to be interviewing you. I believe. Yes, it's yeah. going to be fun. So uh, one thing we decided is instead of doing kind of full uh, podcasts where we just do the entire thing with listener questions, we are going to try to start the top of every episode with a listener question. Mm-hmm. So I have one right here. This one is from Katie. Uh, which do you use, Photoshop or Lightroom? Um, Katie, no offense. That is a bad question. Should you buy a pickup truck or a smart car? That is kind of my my go-to analogy for this. They are two completely different things for two completely different purposes. Do you need to haul lumber or do you need to park downtown? Um, uh, you use Lightroom for cataloging a mass load, huge amount of photos um, and for quickly organizing, for quickly bulk editing and exporting, you do Photoshop when you need some pixel manipulation, when you need to get into one specific photo and you need to do some fancy things to it. Sometimes that can just be some more advanced color correction, um, but a lot of times once you get into clone stamping or you know removing zits or... Yeah. Any, any of that of that heel actual brush. heel brush, <laughs> any of the actual pixel manipulation, um, that's when you're going to use Photoshop. So I know it's I know they're both made by Adobe and they're you know two arms of the same body, but they are completely different things. Use them both. Get yes. to know them both. The answer to do you use Photoshop or Lightroom is yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh today as you mentioned a little bit earlier we are doing a two-part episode um yep. I, I first just kind of want to ask you about these uh fancy new mics since for those of you listening we uh probably sound a little bit different yeah yeah so uh if you are a listener only then this is a great opportunity to check out the uh youtube side of this show because there is an actual set with lights and oh, all yeah. sorts of fancy stuff going on and as you can certainly here um we are now very equally balanced and we've got compression and we've got all sorts of fun uh, audio (laughs) effects going on um yeah so i can go through this really quickly um we have uh, two uh, Shure SM58S microphones, um, which are kind of like performance microphones that I that I really like. They're very forgiving for uh, not acoustically perfect environments. Not no offense like to Ben's studio. Like a concrete <laughs> bunker that we are currently in. That is my new photography studio. Exactly. So we got two mics, two little uh, foam pop filters on them, and they're running into the Rode uh, Rodecaster Pro, um, which is a relatively popular choice. Uh, well, it's got you know four inputs and a bunch of uh, fancy computery stuff and effects and tr- sound triggers uh, like like this <laughs> so it's got all sorts of fun stuff um yeah and it's uh, pretty much the the tool for the job so we got uh, our mics run into that and a couple headphones out so we can hear each other and that's pretty much the setup uh, not too Neat. complicated yeah not too complicated he says <laughs> not too complicated yeah, i mean it's, it's more complicated than the, we were doing before <laughs> but um but yeah it is it is a, an excellent tool i kind of for some reason i've like put off buying one of these and thought like no there's got to be a better solution there's not got to be something else like i knew of this for a long time and eventually i just picked one up and uh yeah it is as good as they say the only thing i don't like is the uh, headphone amplifiers are a little wonky but you can't have everything <laughs> <laughs> All right, so today we are going to get started with our interview, <clears throat> and I'm going to start by kind of explaining this. Uh, so the title is mm-hmm. But Why? So when I was in high school, um, shout out to my high school biology teacher. So we played a game in biology class called But Why? And this mm-hmm. was kind of our, our study for tests. So the very simple example is why do you need air? 
um, you need to breathe. Okay, but why? Because your body needs oxygen. But why? Okay, because, you know, the oxygen is actually used. And we basically, we kept on doing the but why, but why, but why, until we really delved in to the nitty gritty and the inner workings of the thing to get at, oh, yes, that is the thing. That is why. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what we're kind of going to do today is we're going to, uh, today I'm going to dig into Stuart's brain and then watch for the next episode where he's going to interview me. That'll be a scary thought digging into my brain. <laughs> um, but uh, basically, we're just going to go through the process of um, just kind of a shoot beginning to end. What does the whole thing look like? And not necessarily asking, but why? But I really want to get into less of the, um, oh, this is the software I use, and this mm -hmm. is the, you know, all the things that you normally see on YouTube. And I really want to get into um, kind of how you think about things, how you do things, and and just just what's going on. And maybe maybe you chose to do, get the roadcaster, mm -hmm. but why? Why did you choose this tool and uh, rather than any other tool? So those are the kinds of things that we're going to be uh, talking about in this episode. So this is going to be a little bit more of a video centric episode, since obviously Stuart does a lot more video work than I do. Um, but that's what we have in store for us today. Sounds good. Yeah, this is, uh, I mean, maybe we should rename it from photo op to like photo philosophy or something. <laughs> that's, what, that's what this is sounding like to me. <laughs> All right. Let's so get into our minds. Let's let's get into it. Okay, so uh, without further ado, um, what is what is kind of the impetus? What is the thing that actually makes you pick up your camera and want to do a thing? Money. <laughs> that is a good answer. For my job, um, well, there's yeah, there really there really are you know two answers. I mean, one obviously is is for myself in in some respects. The boring answer is obviously for work. Um, I do a lot of uh, corporate video stuff mostly right now, and and some increasingly some streaming, which is which is fun. Live stuff is uh, is tricky. Is a is a a form that I'm trying to learn as quick as I can because it's a uh, it's a big deal right now. But yeah, when I'm when I'm picking up the camera for myself, the more interesting answer is usually one of two things. Um, either it's something that I want to like like personally accomplish, like that I think is is cool and I want to try it, or it's something that I want to learn. And maybe I don't have the expectation that it's going to be perfect, but I want to uh, basically I want the process of the shoot to be. A learning process so those are the kind of the two main ways that i look at picking up a camera gotcha so mm -hmm. so um when you when you've picked something up give us give us a for example that i uh, that is something that is uh frequent for you that we can start frequent. getting that i can start getting a little bit more specific rather than kind of vague booking if you will yeah sure um well something that's pretty frequent white frequent right now and probably the most uh interesting thing i think for people to hear about is uh dive video um, um, that is uh, a big one right now, and I kind of picked that up for multiple reasons. Um, so there's lots of uh, a lots that I can talk there, but yeah, a lot of picking up my camera, so to speak, right now is picking it up to sink it underwater and film stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so um, what what is what is a thing that you would be shooting? Is this client work or is this the thing you want to do? Um, mm -hmm. And so so what is what is the idea of the thing that you're trying to accomplish when you go out and do an underwater shoot? Yeah, so the the thing that I'm trying to do the the grandiose idea is uh, how do you make an underwater video interesting? Which you think a lot of people think, well, why why isn't it already interesting? Because it's difficult. Difficult. And because it's underwater and it's a place that not a lot of people are. And um, if you look at YouTube, there are thousands, hundreds of thousands, you know, at least tens of thousands of videos of dives that have like three views because they're super boring. Maybe it's an interesting thing for a diver to look at, but not for the general public. And for me, I want to figure out how to make that video engaging and interesting and i kind of have silly aspirations of like you know trying to be like planet earth or something <laughs> I, I will never approach that but um but i would like to uh both learn how to do it well like show off the underwater underwater environment in a high quality fashion but also in an educational fashion uh, for people so that they really understand why this is what they're looking at is cool. It's not just a fish. It's, you know, this kind of behavior or um, this is happening to its environment. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to make it uh, trying to make them 
compelling to the average person or at least the average person that's interested in environmentalism kind of stuff i guess <laughs> maybe not okay. purely average. so uh so you get the inspiration to um get something actually set on your calendar you mm -hmm. go out and you're gonna do a dive um from a camera perspective uh, what are what are the things that you're thinking about or preparing before you even go out and get into the water sure thanks yeah so um a recent one that i was part of is a friend of mine and i are working on a project that is um uh, showing a bridge. There's a bunch of collapsed bridges around the Seattle area of the Tacoma Narrows or uh, Galloping Gertie, as some of mm -hmm. you might know, is a particularly famous one. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of uh, sunken bridges in the Seattle area. And we're kind of figuring out how to film them and tell their story and, and kind of show, you know, what happened to these bridges after they hit the water. Like, obviously, new bridges are built. But what happens? Like, there they are generally they're still like there. they're still yeah. there so what what happens are, are you know are they still deteriorating is there cool stuff there you know does anything live on it now um so we're trying to figure that out so one of the things that is obviously big for this topic is uh is how how you can physically capture it there's not a lot of light even during the day oh, there's not yeah. a lot of light that gets through the murky puget sound or like lake washington water um so the biggest thing is how are you going to even expose an image and obviously one side of that is have a camera that has great low light performance, which is increasingly, thankfully, a thing that's not too out of reach. But the other what, one is your, lights. What's your current <laughs> dive camera? Um, right now, I use the Sony uh, a7 III as a dive camera, okay. which um, was a big step up from what I did previously. I had um, various smaller mirrorless cameras and GoPros and stuff, um, but I finally went and got a housing and I grit my teeth every time i sink <laughs> that underwater it's scary um, please please stay yeah. solid please stay sealed exactly so th so there is the 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 question of like does this camera perform well in low light can i push it push its iso as high as i can because you will have to push it to the limits basically but also um you know what kind of lights can i bring underwater like it, there's a lot of equipment that you're just carrying to keep yourself alive um and then you have to add on a bunch of other equipment to oh. try to shoot stuff yeah. um so that can be uh that is a big topic uh, you know bringing bringing light underwater um yeah and making sure that your camera doesn't flood and then like break you know thousands of dollars of <laughs> camera oh, and oh. lenses which there are like vacuum checks and stuff that you can do or you know as as low tech as putting paper towels like in the housing and sinking it and seeing if the paper towels get wet at all <laughs> there's stuff like that so there's alarms and vacuums and stuff but like let's be real you can do all those tests and some of these bad can still happen and you can be, you know, a hundred feet underwater and your camera can start flooding and there's nothing you can do about it except to be sad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, so, so I'm, I'm preserve... sad. <laughs> it hasn't even happened to you and I'm already sad. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, at least, yeah, not so far. It will probably someday, but um, I have insurance for that. So that's good. <laughs> yeah, that uh, that, yeah, is, protecting a, that your is a gear future is a episode one. that is actually on our list that mm -hmm. uh, we've kind of been waffling back and forth about. Um, should you have insurance? Uh, yes. Yes. yes, you should. That's mm -hmm. it. Period. Done. But we can talk more about that in a future yeah, episode. For sure. Um, okay. So so you've kind of prepared all of your gear. You have all your life saving stuff, but mm -hmm. you also have um, the the gear at hand. You've you've got your housing and you've got your lights. So you're actually in the water. Um, what are the what are the things that you're thinking while you're trying to shoot? What are the things that you're looking for? Because mm -hmm. like when I'm shooting a portrait, I can. I, I have full control over the environment. I don't have to find my subject, so to mm -hmm. speak. Mm -hmm. So so what are the things that you're kind of thinking about or looking for that or exploring as you're as you're actually down there diving? Yeah, so it's totally the opposite because you have basically no control of your envi environment and often little to no control of your subject. Sometimes you're actually filming another diver, which that's great because you can generally try to direct them i mean unless like you're hand on hand signals yeah, and... yeah you have lots of hand signals there's lots of like flailing around um <laughs> but uh but yeah it's not like um you know it's not like a, a you know any kind of uh, on land environment where you can take a light and 
put it farther away or you can move it or you can, you know, do this or do that. Um, you're carrying your lights. And so a lot of the, a lot of that is, is more complicated. Sometimes you can place things. Sometimes you dive with like a team of people and they literally, some of them just exist as your light stands underwater, <laughs> hold the light in this angle. Um, but as far as what you're looking for, for a shot, I mean, it, it, it varies a lot. So what you try to do is plan out as much as you can ahead of time. You don't necessarily have control over your environment, but you do have control over how much you plan and what your back, you know, infinite backup plans are. So we had a shot where we wanted one of us swimming along the sidewalk of the bridge um, to kind of be a almost like a throwback of like, you know, people used to walk here along the road and now we're swimming here because it's 80 feet underwater. Um, and so we knew we wanted that shot, but we didn't know what the um, environment would be like. We didn't know what the condition of the bridge would be like. We didn't know if there was going to be, you know, more or less light, uh, what the weather was like that can influence, like rain can make water I, I was really gonna murky. Say, I was going to say yeah. like, how does you're already underwater? Does it really matter what's happening above the water? Yes, when you're very much. Feet down? Very much like rain. Uh, it will just kill your visibility because that makes all of the silt run into the water and it just ruins everything. It de generally doesn't affect, you know, the, uh, you know, the sound or anything. I mean, sometimes you can hear it depending on how close you are to the surface. Well, not but, like you could really record audio underwater anyway. Yeah, I am working on that, but <laughs> it, it's very, it's very difficult. I do actually have you're, the equipment you're, for it. But you're <laughs> recording your audio underwater. You're not mm -hmm. recording the sounds of the water. Though, well, right? yeah, That's... so actually both. So I'm trying to record, uh, this is a tangent, but I'm trying to record. <laughs> record a full face mask audio so people are actually live narrating while they're diving and then also environmental sounds and mixing them together. which it's very uh, complicated. for those of you online uh we've talked about this a little bit offset it's a thing that currently does not exist like when you go to very little <laughs> yeah when you go to the aquarium and they are doing like a live show like yeah. this is literally the only place you see it he has one of those yeah i have that stuff um but it's yeah it's complicated i we don't need to get too too much into it this episode because it's not the point of the episode but yeah the the grand scheme what i'm trying to get at is um, you try to plan as much as you can. So what we would do is just have backup shots. So for like, if, if it's too murky here, or like if we screw up and we kick up some silt, then let's look for another spot. You know, we we know that there's like this edge of the bridge that we could go along. We know that there is, you know, this side is deeper than the other side. And so I'm like, maybe we try the, the shallower side first because it has more light. But if that doesn't work out for some reason, maybe we try the deeper side, which is darker, but has like less silt. Uh, for example. So there's a lot of just contingency plans. All diving is like contingency plans, whether you're um, doing, uh, you know, whether for life support, like you always have contingency plans. Like what if I run out of air? What if one of my, uh, you know, regulators stops working? What if this, what if that? You have all these contingency plans and then you, you approach shooting underwater the same way. All contingency plans all the time. And generally you try to be weirdly although you can't you don't have control you almost try to be inflexible and in that you don't you don't just kind of go off the cuff and shoot something you are like cool that didn't work i'm going to do this next plan that didn't work i'm going to do this next plan and there's you try to always shoot to the plan instead of adapting okay strangely enough <laughs> yeah because yeah. i adapt all the time yep and uh, you just you just kind of ha don't have that luxury because you have a clock all the time right. it's like you 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 will literally run out of air and not be able to breathe so stick you to the plan yeah stick to the plan and if you know it, sometimes it doesn't work out sometimes you run out of plans and you run out of time and that's it and then the the, the backup plan for that is come back another day <laughs> with oh, more yeah. with more gas so that you can continue so um yeah it's uh it's it's lots and lots and lots of planning basically so um when you're when your brain is trying to come up with um compositions and stuff obviously uh, underwater is kind of such a crazy mm -hmm. aspect that not a lot of people do and mm -hmm. part of that i imagine is just oh crap let me get whatever i can get like yep. it's not ideal but i'm just going to um how do you kind of uh plan and set up your camera do you just shoot like super wide and plan on cropping it later no, no. or do you try and get all your shots in camera how do you i do try do to get shots in camera do, <laughs> yeah but like but like how do you think about getting getting um, that more cinematic quality that you're looking for mm -hmm. kind of in your shots uh, what are the things that you're thinking about kind of as a cinematographer or yep. a DP would think about? So I'm always looking for emotion. Um, that is, uh, I think that's, that's one of the biggest things that you have underwater all the time is there's, there's always movement going on and it's a matter of like, what movement do you want to show? And one of the very difficult things is like, if you want 
you know, if you have like fish over a reef or something, um, you don't also want to move probably because then you can't focus on the fish. You can't see what you're actually trying to show off. And so you have to stay very stable. The problem is you're not attached to anything. So how do you stay stable without oh, being able yeah. to stand in place or have it on a tripod or something? So it's very, um, I am always, I basically try to shoot underwater as I do, um, on land. Uh, I really do. I, I try to follow, you know, good composition rules. Um, I try to follow lighting as much as I can. Um, I try to make sh shots stable and smooth. Um, you kind of try to almost shoot like a gimbal. Like if you're trying to do a, a shot where the camera actually moves, you try to stay as stable and as smooth as you possibly can um, to make that shot look good. So the strange thing, the environment is totally alien and, and largely out of your control but you're trying to like exert your will over it and get <laughs> and get a shot that would stand up even outside of the water. You're ba you basically my philosophy is just because it's underwater doesn't mean it's, as it, that it's an excuse to have bad shots. Like things should be exposed as good as they can be. Um, they should be as smooth and as stable as they can be. Uh, it's yes, it's a novel environment, but I feel like don't use that as a crutch to not be better. I I see that a lot um, when it comes to pretty much any kind of subject where um, it is beautiful in its own right. Mm -hmm. Like if you if you <laughs> just for example, the photo uh, for those of you watching on YouTube, the photo right behind Stuart's head is a photo that I took in Iceland. If you Google photos of Iceland, you're going to see a lot of really bad photos. You're not going to think are bad photos because they're beautiful, mm -hmm. but they're only beautiful because iceland but it's just a lot of the cliche like oh it's a field yep. it's it's looking literally straight down a road um th Sh there's nothing that interesting about it except the fact iceland shooting in tropical water is like that it's like there are pretty reefs and fish everywhere and you're just like cool i, I don't have to try at all i can just point my camera and it looks great around here in the pacific northwest <laughs> It's murky and terrible, and there are very cool things, but it's very difficult to show the beauty of those things. But, so it's a struggle, yeah, I, I which I kind of like. It's like it's, it's you know you have to work <laughs> for it. <laughs> that 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 is that is nice. There's some satisfaction of like, yeah, it wasn't easy, and I did that. Exactly. But but I think more the point of like, um, just because you can you know throw your camera in the air and mm -hmm. whatever direction it lands hopefully not on concrete but whatever direction it lands uh is going to take a good photo uh that is not really a reason to be sloppy and take bad photos which yep. i've seen a lot yeah yeah so so funny enough that kind of the same philosophy applies um which i think a lot of people don't 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 see that at first like it's just like oh well you know it's it's underwater and and you see people that start diving and start bringing cameras underwater that just it, like they're the most boring things ever because they think it's so cool they're like well i was there and it's so difficult to do this and i can just take my so, gopro uh, and it just looks fine something, it's like, Ugh. something That's why that people i watch have it, learned so much is just because you t uh, just because it was difficult or that you spent a monumental amount of effort doing it mm -hmm no one cares it doesn't yep. make it good yep yeah you can appreciate it for the sentimental value but none of that context is going to get transferred when someone watches it and that's why i'm trying to crack that code basically like i'm a glutton for punishment and it seems like i always <laughs> want to you always want to try the hardest yeah, thing <laughs> i always want to be like what is the most technically complicated video or photo project i could possibly do and this is I'm approaching the limits of what is available to me without going into space. So, <laughs> but, but it's not an excuse, right? I want to figure out how to make it not boring. Um, and pretty much the only way to do that is to, uh, be like, you know, the BBC team responsible for planet earth or blue planet or whatever, which are incredible people. Um, but they are like the narrowest of narrow sets and I'm trying to compete with them and so far failing, but that's fine. <laughs> I expect to fail for a long time before I'm good at this. Uh, I mean, that's, that's how you grow and how you learn. That's, yeah, that's what yeah. you're saying. Your, so, your main thing is you, when you take on a project, you want to learn. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's a lot of learning. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> you just have to be a good diver first and that can take, you know, hundreds of dives, thousands sometimes if you're, you know, really into it, but uh yeah it's uh it's a it, that's one of the things that i like about it is it's a journey and for me even if the results are not good it's satisfying because i learned something um you know i'd love for the results to be good and to be able to show off some amazing shot Obviously. but um but if it's if it's a project that's for me i want to have some sort of satisfaction even if a cool 
you know, clip doesn't come out on the other side and for, and diving is great for that. Like you're probably going to have fun. Um, even some of the worst dives have generally had some redeemable quality to them, even if it was like a total bust. Um, I've had some of those recently. <laughs> <laughs> it turned out okay. Everything, everybody's fine, but uh, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, we did a dive in a friend's <laughs> pool trying to do a portrait shot yeah, of you, was, and that was a total bust. But it was redo. a good story. Yeah, we'll yeah. we'll tell it one day when it has a happy ending. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, we're gonna yeah we we're gonna we want to revisit again. that before we tell the story. <laughs> <laughs> it's been bad. uh a uh, quick giveaway. I have a photography book for who, anyone who can tell us the exact amount of times we have mentioned that on the last 78 episodes. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> okay, so so you pop up for air. Mm-hmm. You you back up all your footage. Um, just kind of to to wrap this up. What what are kind of the things that you're thinking about when you're when you're either going into the edit? Um, mm-hmm. Is it do you want to like let it simmer? Do you do you get excited and you kind of want to hit it right away when you're in the edit? Um, how are you kind of processing all of the footage in your brain to finally like you're you actually put out a video of like hey i did a thing Mm -hmm. like how how does that finishing process look like i think i think a lot of it like you you know when you get the shot um underwater and you're and you can kind of you can you you kind of already know to yourself like i this this is going to be good like i know that this turned out well and so there's those shots that when you're walking out of the water, practically, you're like, I want to grab that right away. And so um, generally with me, I have some amount of shots uh, that I export something quickly right away um, just to show and to to kind of figure out how I want to cut it down further. Um, I will do like I will basically do those shots first, the shots that I remember being good underwater. Um those don't always work out exactly how you want them to, but that's what I try to get first. Um, I'll scrub through the whole thing and watch it. Um, I'm somebody that notoriously uh, hates my own work immediately after it's done, and so <laughs> there's a lot of there's a lot of like all of this is garbage. Uh, I'm going to throw it all away. Uh, well, I don't throw I don't delete anything, so I don't throw it away technically. But <laughs> there's a lot of that going on. So I, I have a lot. I have struggles uh, personally with. Um, appreciating my own work and and showing it to people because i think well if i don't like it then nobody else is going to like it so why should i show it to anybody and waste their time i think a lot of us have that struggle i mean Mm -hmm. uh for anyone who follows me on social media you want to know why i don't post very often yeah that's why yeah and and i bring it up not to like self-flagellate or anything but i just want people to know that i know there's a lot of people out there that have that same struggle and um and feel like i can't show anything because it's all garbage and i want to tell you that one that continues forever at least in my experience um and, and two you should try not to feel that way uh the fact that you put out something is better than than putting out nothing and i have terabytes and terabytes and terabytes you know tens of terabytes at this point of of stuff that i've never released um and that is not good and i can say that it's not good and basically say do as i say not as i do (laughs) i'm trying to like you know trap myself publicly into eventually releasing things on a regular basis but um i do want to share that 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 is a struggle and i understand that it's a struggle for people Uh, and i struggle with it too even doing something like as monumentally technically difficult as like trying to shoot good dive footage i still after all that think well this is garbage i i want to redo it but that being said going into the edit um I, uh, you know, if you, if you're, if you've gone according to plan, you generally know, like, you know, this shot worked and that kind of helps alleviate some of the stress. Cause you're like, oh, okay, well this, this wasn't plan a, but this was plan D, but Hey, we got plan D and we know what that looks like. And sometimes you go back over and over and over to get the exact shots that you want. And then it becomes one of those projects where it's like, I've sunk, you know, 200 hours into this like one minute thing <laughs> but that's Ooh, how yeah. you but that's how it works sometimes um so going into the edit is is difficult it's basically um for me kind of back to what i was talking about before i try to look at it as externally as i can um, because i'll get excited for something that i was a part of but is anybody who watches you know anybody who watches this if they weren't involved in the process do they care can I make this look interesting? Can we explain this in an interesting way? Is it showing something that can be communicated to them? And so I look at it very much from a documentary kind of style, which it tends to be the way that I shoot things for fun is really shoot more to portray reality. I don't consider myself an artist at all. I consider myself more of a documentarian or, um, you know, you know, I just want to like, 
point a lens at the world basically and, and show the world itself almost if that makes any sense oh yeah totally. and so i look at it very much from like a, a reality kind of perspective that being said i do enjoy stuff like the pool shoot that we attempted where we try to do some something really cool and different and visually unique and i would love to if i have any control over the shot any control over the environment i try to show that kind of stuff there's these you know amazing weird otherworldly visuals you can get of like you know kelp moving in a kelp forest or even just bubbles from your breath making a cool pattern as they go up to the surface and there's a lot of like interesting textural quality and, and artistry that you can really get into if you pay attention um and so i try to look for that kind of stuff too like i want to be visually engaging but i also want to you know to tell some kind of story about the environment and sometimes it's as easy as like look at this bridge that's literally still here and sometimes it's as difficult as this is like a really subtle behavior of some fish and here's why you should care um and that can be difficult to convince people to care <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah true mm -hmm. words mm -hmm. have never been spoken that is yeah, yeah. that is absolutely <laughs> monumental uh no one, one of the things i think that's interesting about that is uh when you're saying that you kind of shine shine a light or a lens back at the world mm -hmm. um one of the things i think about is there's kind of two types of people like if there's a landscape photographer and um there's like a soda can kind of in your way mm -hmm. there's there's two types of people there's the person that will be like no it is the way it is and then there's the person who will pick up the can and get it out of the shot and then there's the third type of person which is the absolute worst they will leave the can in there <laughs> and then decide later ah, i'm gonna photoshop it out no no <laughs> get it in camera <laughs> no uh <laughs> But uh, yeah, I, I I do think that that's kind of um, there's there's one thing to be said of like I have this vision of how this should look, and that's that's kind of the way I look at things. But you're like, no, this is how it looks. Mm -hmm. Of like of that can to you could tell a story versus me, it's like nas clutter. Yeah, no, and I have I actually have some of that stuff. So I was lucky enough to go on a liveaboard boat on the Great Barrier Reef um, a number of years ago, and uh, unfortunately, uh, it's even worse now. But even then there was a lot of uh reef die off um due to ocean acidification and, and rising temperatures and stuff don't have to get into the whole story but um there was a lot of reef that was dying and it looked gray and not fun and not cool and not pretty and colorful um but i filmed a huge quantity of it because to me i'm like this is what's happening right now and i want to show the pretty it's a story yeah. yeah it's a story and i want to show the pretty fish and i but that almost adds, you know, that adds a, a significant um, amount of contrast to it. Sometimes literally, <laughs> like, here's what this could be with all of the stuff that's that's living and vibrant and pretty right now. And right next to it, here's what it might be in the future. Um, and unfortunately, that it is continuing to struggle and there are big sections that continuing to die. And I've shown that footage to people and um, I've done talks about it and it's... Uh, yeah, it's really, um, it's really unfortunate, but that can really tell that story to people that otherwise don't care. They're like, so the reef is dying. Like who cares? It's, it's like a gazillion square miles. Right. But if you can show them and be like, literally this was shot the same day. This is the, this is all the fish and the reefs and stuff being happy. And this is what it's going, what's going to happen to it. If we don't change something, um, that can really help hit home and be like, wow, it's like a wasteland. Like, you know, it, people that even don't understand the intricacies of what's exactly going on can see how dead it is. And, um, yeah, I, I want to show that kind of stuff and, uh, you know, stuff like bridges, it's kind of silly because it's not necessarily like the most environmentally destructive thing in the world. And I, and I don't, and I'm not somebody that like wants to harp on environmental destruction all the time because people get depressed and then they check out, right. They're just like, yeah. you're just a, you're just a negative Nancy. Like, why do I want to listen to you? Um, you're just, you're just want to be negative all the time. And I really don't want to be because there is hope for that stuff. And, um, you know, I think there's some amount of, of, uh, enjoyment and, and some kind of, you know, you can almost poke fun at humanity with stuff like these bridges. It's like, look at how stupid we were that we thought that this bridge was perfect and it was going <laughs> to last and it definitely wouldn't, uh, you know, fall down due to wind or anything. And you could kind of sh show this, um, amusing aspect to the world, which is humanity failed, but things are living on it anyway and are making, making a life out of it. Uh, and I like that aspect too, that there is a, uh, there is strange positivity there in a way, <laughs> kind of a darkly 
humorous way in my opinion <laughs> darkly strange positivity i yeah. like it i think i think that's a perfect place to wrap up this episode any any closing thoughts uh or, no or advice for for people to things to think about to become better filmmakers uh yeah i mean obviously the the thing that everybody harps on which i'm going to harp on as well as uh you know, as, as stated as much as this is, is, is you want to tell a story, right? Like it's not good if you're not telling a story. And in my opinion, it's not good if you can't be able to, can't get people to care about your story. I think that's a, a, you can tell a story, but if it's a story that nobody cares about, then what's the point? Like you need to get them to care and then be invested in that story to follow it to, along all of its peaks and valleys. And so obviously storytelling is the biggest thing. Um, you know, you don't have to be the most technically amazing, perfect thing ever, but, you know, tell a story and release the story. And I think that's all that matters. Uh, you're going to suck and you're going to continue to think that you suck as your abilities um, progress and your taste outstrips your abilities. And so if you think you suck, that's in a good, that's in a good, you're in a good place, but um, it's not going to be a happy place. You can, try you to can release keep it getting anyway. better. <laughs> yeah. You can keep getting Just better. Just publish though. it anyway. Don't be me. <laughs> I like uh, I like showing stuff live like to an audience. Uh, right now in COVID you can't, but uh, that's why I really liked giving talks because you know I could uh, I could stumble over my poor work and um, explain why it was bad to an audience, <laughs> and, and now I can't do that. So, all right, all right. You know. Well, well. Here, let's <laughs> let's uh, let's let's do do a little uh, challenge for each other. Mm -hmm. uh, we're both gonna post more. It, let's let's say once a that's week. Plan. Once a week. Ooh, once a week. Once a week. <sighs> Even if it's, it's old, even if it's old footage, <laughs> yeah. even yeah. if it's old footage, post something. Whether yeah. whether it's a success or a failure or something cool you did, uh, we're we're gonna show the world stuff we're doing. All Sound right. good? Sounds, Sounds good? good. Sounds good. Boom! <laughs> I love being here in studio because we can't do that when we're recording remote. Physical we, interaction. Phys Whoa. Physical fist bump. We're What's in a real up? place. Oh, I love I'm it. not just in a gray void. I don't just <gasps> live in a gray void. You you left your gray <laughs> void. Exist. This is fabulous. <laughs> fabulous. All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for listening. Um, we are going to, in the next episode, flip the script on this, and he is going to interview me. Mm -hmm. So uh, until next time, uh, you go ahead and send in any of your questions. Um, Hello at photo-op.show. Yeah. I, I always want to give my own personal <laughs> email at that point. You can email me, too. That's fine yeah fine sure <laughs> go say hello to ben send him, <laughs> send him your questions if you have questions or ideas for future episodes you can email us at hello at photo dash op dot show watch us on ben's youtube channel at non creative as in om nom nom share this with a friend and you can listen to photo op anywhere podcasts are sold or downloaded because it's free